Thank you. It's super exciting to be here. Good morning on this beautiful day. So I'm going to talk to you about understanding what's in the tail of interactive web applications. And once you understand it, how the different things that can be responsible for tail latency need to be optimized a little differently. So I'm going to go over some of those. A bunch of the research today in my talk is joint work with my collaborators Shi Yang and Steve Blackburn at Australian National University, and my collaborators at Microsoft, my former employer, uh, MD Hawk, Sam Elnukidi, Yushang He, and Ricardo Bianchi. So hopefully you won't be using your phone too much during this talk, but when you are using it, you want it to be super responsive. And human, we're, we're impatient people, and if that phone doesn't respond to you quickly, you're really unhappy. And you're so unhappy, you stop searching, and uh, the providers who are trying to engage you with a good user experience uh, don't get as much of your attention and you abandon it. So we really care about tail latency. And that's our top pri one of our top priority in optimizing your, your, uh, your, your experience. So what's behind that? Servers in big data centers with lots of networking, they're consuming lots of power, and they have lots of processors. And this data comes from um, the Lawrence Berkeley Livermore Labs, and they collect uh, government data and company data about data centers. And this is uh, just a snapshot of what's in data centers in 2014, and then based on their data, they did a forecast. So the bottom is a branded one socket. Uh, that means one NUMA socket, so everything's shared together. And then the red is branded two plus sockets. So that means we've made a real shift so that now most servers have at least two NUMA do domains, which are separate uh, memory and processors, but still a strong interconnect and all using the same power. And then we have a little thin bar of unbranded socket. And what unbranded means is you're not buying it from someplace like Intel or AMD or, or uh, any other provider. And what you're doing is you're custom building something for your specific workload. And this is a huge trend right now in, uh, in hardware with the end of Denard scaling and uh, the practical implications on Moore's law, what we're we're seeing in hardware is more and more specialized components. But those, as you can see from this diagram, those specialized components, they aren't taking over the whole chip. The chip manufacturers are still helping us. They're uh, instead an add-on to, to this chip. And the TPU at Google is an example of that. And uh, Microsoft's FPGA for their networking is another example of that. So this is kind of what's under there and what we're trying to use to give you that great experience. And then once you build and put something in the data center, you're not done paying for it yet because it consumes energy. And the, the 2000 trend was we're going to consume ton, tons and tons of energy, but companies like Google and Microsoft and Facebook and Intel were super motivated to lower that cost. And so you see a nice, nice actual engineering trend we have here that uh, the, the energy that, that data centers were consuming did not go up at the same rate as the number of servers. That, that as an industry, as a hard, the hardware industry did a great job doing that. And then there's a bunch of lines that are potential predictions, which is we follow the current trend, and that's that uh, top dotted line, not the exponential dotted line, but the, the flat line. And then under that, we have what's called better, which is uh, better software, better hardware design that can help lower those costs. And that's what I'm going to talk today about, trying to build better software that consumes less energy and uses these more efficiently or bigger. And what does bigger mean? That means more NUMA domains on a chip, more sockets. And then you can put those together, and then there are some best practices that other people have learned, and we can share them, and we can do even better. So we could like, even decrease the amount of energy consumed in, uh, in US data centers, and that would be a great thing both for the environment and for the bottom lines of the big companies. 
All right, so here's some quick facts about how much money that represents. So a very small uh, data center might cost about $500,000, and there's still a lot of people building their own data center for their workloads, so that's still happening. And then there are about 3 million data centers right now in 2016 in the US. These are all estimates from that same report. 1.5 trillion US capital investments, because it's not just how many build we build each year, but how many there are. And that is a lot of money. And so even if you save 1% of that in improving performance, reducing the footprint, you can save $30 million by doing less work. So lots more if you improve the capacity of the server to handle more workload and not even, and so you don't even have to build a data center. That's a, hopefully some of the solutions I will uh, show you today convince you. So that says efficiency is a great, important top priority to all these companies in order to, to make money and also to be a good global citizens. But these are things are in conflict. And so how can we get both? And that's what I'm going to focus on today. So just going a little deeper into what's in that server architecture behind your interactive service is usually your request goes to a server, and then that gets branched out to uh, a bunch of different workers. And they logically use uh, parallelism and replication at each of these servers in order to get reliability, scalability, and throughput. So the aggregated farm out the request, they wait for workers to respond, and then they return a response to the user. Since the overall response time is, is, can be no better than the slowest server, that slowest server, that tail latency, really matters to your user experience. And so the, that, and that's usually the 99th percentile latency, or higher, or 98th. And I'm just going to colloquial call that the tail latency. All the numbers today I'll, I'll be giving you on, on tail latency will be 99 percentiles. All right. So what are the underlying characteristics of, of interactive services? As my example today, I'm going to use Lucene. And I have uh, Lucene is an open source Java serve search uh, enterprise search, and it's widely used. Disney uses it, so for its to 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 uh, do search on its local sites. So if you go to Disneyland, you want to see Mickey Mouse, you type Mickey Mouse in. Lucene is telling you where Mickey Mouse is. All right. So so even though it's not Google search, it's not Bing search. It is a a, a good workload, and some of the techniques I'll talk about today have been uh, incorporated in Bing, and the, the workload in Bing uh, while I was at Microsoft matched this pretty closely, and, and a workload uh, that's public ab about Google at the Tail at Scale paper by Dean Imbaroso, that, that also shows this kind of workload. So what is this kind of workload? So if you look at the percentage of requests on the y-axis, and then you look at the latency on the on the x-axis, you see a lot of requests are really short, and a few requests are really long. And you see that red line? That's called the, uh, that's the cumulative distribution function. And you can see that that has this certain shape. And that shape changes very slowly. So even if your underlying workload, like today uh, or this weekend, football got like exceedingly more popular even because we mixed football and, uh, and, and, and politics. And what happened was this CDF doesn't change that much, even though the underlying queries that are inside it change a lot. All right? So the slowest server that's over here on the side, though, unfortunately, is what dictates the tail. And, the, and we also have very bursty diurnal workloads. Something interesting happens. The hurricane happens, more people search, more people in a certain area search for certain things. All right. And there's an order of magnitude difference between this average latency and the tail latency. And so if we're going to try to bring down that tail, we have to understand it in more detail than this. And that's what we're going to do next. 
So the overview of where we're going now is we have to have better tools in order to diagnose what's in the tail. And then we're going to reveal three sources of, of things that cause tail latency. Noise, systems aren't perfect, some network queues, some operating sc system scheduler queues, something bad happens. Queuing, you have too much load. You can't handle the burstiness. So, so you've got to over-provision somewhat or do additional uh, replication in order to handle too much load. Or work, if there's actually work in those long requests, you have to do something else instead. And we're going to show a couple of things, parallelism and also using faster processors. And the insight in this talk is because that cumulative distribution function doesn't change, we can solve optimization problems offline. And then we can apply them online by just using functions that we learned offline. And then online, we can also detect if the shape of this curve changes a lot. And if it does, then we can offline resolve this harder optimization problem and then use the results online. So I'm going to show you several examples of that. So if you don't remember anything else from this talk, remember that cumulative distribution function is your friend, and you can use it offline to improve tail latency. All right. Oh, and the second insight that you'll see used repeatedly over the, this uh, talk is that long requests reveal themselves. While your request is becoming a long one, there are certain points in time that you can recognize because there's an order of magnitude difference between a slow request and a long request. All the slow requests should be done by now. This long request is still executing, and there's sufficient time to react to that and improve that long request. All right, so here's the simplified life of a request. So this is uh, the you have some client application, goes through the network, it goes to the aggregator, then the aggregator sends it over the network, then some worker OS and VM process it, and it goes down through the application, and then it has to come back. All right, how do we understand that? The prior state of the art is in this great talk from Dick Seitz at Google, and so if you are a Turing Award winner, you can do this too. All right, so you hand instrument the system. That, requ that requires deep understanding. And now that we have more and more of what are called microservices, which are individual components all contributing to uh, overall response, then that's more and more systems someone has to be an expert in and has to understand how to instrument properly. You get a 1% budget sample. So what you have to do is turn it on and off. And you have to profile it ahead of time so you know how much time all this instrumentation you've in introduced on the critical path of your interactive services, which is also not a good idea, is uh, slowing you down. And then you get offline semantics, and you have insight, and you improve the system. So here's an example of one of those offline semantics. Sem offline schematics and some of the difficulty you see in, in, uh, in trying to figure out what the critical paths are through here. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to do an automated instrumentation that also has 1% and gives you continuous online profiling of the cumulative distribution function and also can break down what's, what's in the different uh, components of all, all those requests. Still have to have offline semantics. Maybe you don't have to be a Turing Award winner, but maybe you do because these systems are very complicated to improve. But I'm going to show you some ways we can do it. All right, so this work is how we do this cycle level online profiling with the minimum distur disturbing of the system. So our insight here was that Hardware is just generating signals. And those signals, you can read out a hardware performance counter. That's one way to see a signal. But also, memory locations can communicate signals. They can communicate values or counters. And so there we go, all those things I just said. <laughs> and, then, and all of these are things you can read from another thread. All right? You don't have to have an interrupt 
The common way of doing this is instrument the code or have an interrupt in order to read these signals. If you're running in the same thread in a shared process, you can just read those out of shared locations. And so that's what we did. So the other core has a processor on it. For example, it reads last level misses per, per cycle. It uh, has just a really simple loop while true for counter in the last level counts and cycles. I'm going to put into a buffer and read those counters. So I'm not going to do much processing on that. I'm going to do the processing on it later offline. I'm just going to stick it in the buffer. And you can also control through, uh, through uh, cache partitioning mechanisms. You can also control how much uh, memory this uses and how much it interferes with the shared uh, caching. So, or you can actually do it on the same core in, in hyperthread or simultaneous multi-threading uh, cores that are sharing resources, but it interferes more. And so then you have to be a little more careful and you have to correct for uh, the IPC that, uh, that, that Shim, our, our uh, profiler, is causing you. And so you still just stick it in there, but you do the math later. All right, and this lets you read memory locations or hardware context. So this seems so easy. Why hasn't somebody done this before? Ah, uh, because that doesn't work quite perfectly. So here's uh, instructions per cycle. This machine issues four instructions per cycle at the maximum. And so we have some numbers over here greater than 10. Mm, that's a problem, all right? <laughs> and this is the log of the samples. And, uh, and why does that happen? So the problem is the way we're taking the samples in that loop is not atomic. And you, you read the counter, you, you start the, the, the counter, you read some other ones, and that looks pretty good. If those samples are taken at, take the same amount of time, then you've got good fidelity data. But occasionally, when you're taking the sample, something else happens, like you get a cache miss or you get paged out. And so that time at which you're taking the sample changes. And then you can't compare the two samples. You don't have a correct sample. So the way to detect that is actually not too amazingly hard. What you can do is you can read out the cycles at, at the beginning of each of two intervals and at the end. And if the, the two times agree, cycles per cycle agree, then that's a good sample because it took the same amount of time to take that sample. And the other great thing about this technique is if it, over time, it changes how long it takes it to take a sample because someone else starts interfering with you or you have shared hardware, this can adapt to that change because it's not saying you, this is how long it should take. It's saying just compare the ones next to me. Did I take the same amount of time? If I did, I can, I can do that. So we're using the clock as the down ground truth. We compute this ratio of cycles per cycle, and then we can simply get rid of bad samples. So now if we go back to our problematic trace and we look at that yellow now that I, bar that I put back on there is cycles per cycle. So you can see that cycles per cycle uh, corresponded to a lot of, of the noise out on the side. So when we do the filtering and we make it just consider the ones that our cycles per cycle is 1% is of one, then we get rid of all the bad data that we were seeing that we, is clearly wrong because you can't issue more than four at once. But we, and we also get rid of some that were too short. Now, do we know this is perfect yet? Do we know it has perfect fidelity? No, of course not. There can be other things happening. But this is much closer to what looks like ground truth. And so here's an example of how powerful this approach is. If you, instead of using, in, inter, if you use interrupt-driven sampling right now, and you take the IPC of individual methods in Lucerne, you get what you would expect to get if you're sampling something that has a high signal-to-noise ratio, 
because you're sampling it too low. You get a flat, it's all the same. And even if you go up to the maximum of 100 hertz, you get the same. But if you sample with shim at 10 megahertz, you get a much more fine-grained um, a knowledge about what's going on in your program, and here we can identify method number four as being a real problem. So how, and then overheads are important. If you're reading it from the same core, you're always gonna have a lot of overhead. If you read from another core and you try to read at 30 cycles, you can, but you get a factor of two overhead. But if you slow it down to reading about every 1,000 cycles, you can basically make this uh, not interfere with that thread on the other core. So now that we have the right mechanism to watch this, let's configure our, our shim thread to look at thread IDs, timestamps, and program counters, things we can always read out of memory. So those are awesome. But we need to also look at request IDs, okay? So the the software you're using has to say a little bit more about what it's doing. In this case, it just needs to give you a request ID. So when we do a sample, we know this thread is working on a certain request because the same thread will work on multiple requests. So that's all we need to add to our, our, uh, our program to get this to work. All right, and so now we can take that uh, cumulative distribution graph and now what I've done is spread it, write it down a little differently. And I have request groups from the slowest to the fastest and the latency on the y-axis. And now I just have client latency versus average queuing time. So you can see, hey, all right, long requests have, if we concentrate over there, long requests have, have uh, some queuing time and they also have some work time. So now what we're gonna do is just take the 99 percentile and look at those in more detail, and we're gonna use the program counter to tell us what, where these, the, what these requests were doing when they, um, when, when they incurred the long latency. So this is the tail. These are the longest requests. And now you've been waiting for 10 minutes, and we're finally at this part. All right, so what we see is um, in many of the requests, there is a lot of queuing at the worker. And there's some blue, there's some network trash. And so what does that mean? That means my network controller, like maybe it's not getting scheduled properly, or maybe it just has too much work, so it's causing some queuing. So network imperfections. And you see a little bit of orange, and that reveals OS imperfections. This thread is ready to run. It's sitting around on the core somewhere, but somehow it's not running. But then you see lots and lots of green. Some of the very longest requests are mostly work. And no matter what you do about queuing and making your system more perfect and getting rid of noise, you won't get rid of work in long requests by doing that. All right, so we're gonna talk about techniques. Uh, first, a technique that concentrates on noise and random events, and then we're gonna talk about techniques that don't uh, have noise in them, like how you get rid, how you reduce the tail, and do that efficiently with work. So the insight here is long requests reveal themselves so we can do something specially about them, and this is regardless of the cause. But if the cause is noise, all right, we can replicate and reissue. The basic system architecture I showed you already has replication in it, so if one server's slow, probably another one's not, unless you're overloaded, so, so you do need to take into account load. And so you can use the the CDF to tell you both the cost and the potential for reissuing a request. So let's say you have a fixed issue time, which was the state of the art until a few weeks, a few months ago. <laughs> so you, what you would do is say, I, want it re I have a budget to reissue 10%. So that's not a perfect solution because if the reason that you experiencing slow latencies is because you're overloaded, adding 10% is, uh, can, 
is not efficient, you're using more resources, and it's also not handling the things that actually do more work, it's just making more work for the system. And it can uh, cause some queuing, more queuing. So maybe you want to move it over to 5% reissued in order to mitigate those extra costs. But you still have some budget at which you're, you're, you're reissuing, and that has a cost. All right. So recently, some my former colleagues had a really nice paper at SPA about probabilistic reissue. Because you have different reasons for tail latency, let's move this line over. So we can reissue sooner, but let's reissue probabilistically and not always do the reissue based on the budget. And then by adding this randomness, they actually have a beautiful proof that shows you uh, one reissue time with randomness is equivalent to multiple reissue times based on different features. And so this uh, gives some beautiful results that are copied straight out of the paper because they didn't get me the slides in time. So, 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 the, so, so on the far left, we have 99th percentile on the y-axis of all three of these graphs. The far left is their single random, random reissue, which is the bottom red line. And then the, the state of the art prior to that, which is this blue line, which is the single one time you always reissue at that delay. So if your budget is 1%, for example, you reissue, you'd figure out the D from the cumulative distribution function, and you'd always reissue everyone. So in their approach, your reissue budget is 1%, but you get to do it sooner, and you get to do it randomly. And you can see it has a beautiful curve. Now, latency versus reissue rate as a function of utilization on the second graph shows you the problem. When the reason is overcommitted, you can, when you start reissuing, even at a very small budget of 6% or 5%, then you're adding too much load to the system, and you're just making things worse. So you really need to keep track of load. And then this is their best reissue result for, Lu and these are Lucene results, because I promised you I was going to show you lots of stuff about Lucene. And so here, they definitely reduce the tail by doing this reissue, but they have a cost. All right, so that's a good idea, and we, people should use that for the responsiveness. But if it's work, it's in the tail, which we just saw it's often work, that doesn't speed up the tail. So what speeds up things? Parallelism. We have lots of parallelism on these machines. And so I'm going to show you why throughput optimizations didn't work for tail latency, but we can use parallelism on a single machine to improve tail latency. And then I'm going to talk about another thing that's on every machine today, which is dynamic voltage scaling, to take to identify the tail requests and improve those. And then a solution that's on your phone, but not yet in servers, but could be, is asymmetric multi-core, where you combine a big core that can execute re responses faster and little cores. And why do you want little cores? Won't that slow stuff down? Well, you're going to slow down the little requests, the sh shorter requests. And so you're going to sacrifice average in order to improve the tail. And that gets you efficiency and capacity. And I'll show you that, and then we'll be done with the talk. All right, so work parallelism. Parallelism has historically been used in these systems for throughput. We hand it multiple requests. It does each one completely independently, and that works great. So the idea for using parallelism for tail latency is it, in, you could have every request be parallel, all right? So this is a fixed level of parallelism. Every request comes in, and you parallelize it. Why isn't that a good idea? Well, in the past, we didn't use it for throughput because parallelism has overhead. For the short requests, it's useless. And so th those see overhead. So that hurts throughput in systems that have uniform distributions of request time. All right. And, uh, but that's not the tail. So if we judiciously use parallelism, 
after some delay, only on things that are going to be in the tail, then we do pay a little bit of overhead, but we ramp down the tail latency and, uh, and we shorten queuing. And once you shorten those tails, you actually reduce queuing of the overall system. So in our system, in steady state, you see this little diagram. You have a bunch of little short requests running, and then you have some longer requests that has revealed itself, and you've incrementally added parallelism to it. All right, so how do we do that? Well, every D, this just shows the animation. I'm not ready for this. All right, so, so if we do um, a thread that is at fixed D, OK? So you just wait a, a little bit, and then you add a fixed amount, regardless of load or uh, the number of requests in the system then uh, you get the following graph. So here's the sequential time. So if I say every request uh, is going to be four-way parallelism at delay zero, then I get a good graph. At very low latencies, I improve the tail, but I can't handle enough load because I've added overhead to the system, and I've uh, and, and, and that overhead decreases the maximum amount of requests per second. So if I wait a little while and then add my parallelism, I do better. And if I only wait 20 milliseconds, I can't, I'm almost out there at sequential time at high loads. But if I wait longer, then I'm more likely to apply the parallelism only to the tail. And if I wait even longer, I can push my request per second out even further. So, but we'd like to have the best of all those worlds, that green line. So can we get to that green line? Yes. So what we do is we take those cumulative distribution functions, and then we profile the parallelism and the parallelism efficiency on the longer requests. And so that gives us a target amount of parallelism. So that gives you, in our systems, we saw, and this was implemented in Bing, we saw, um, saw about four was the right number. Sometimes three would be the right number of threads to add to work. And, and most of these, many of these systems are very parallel. And so then, what, sorry, then what we do is uh, offline, we exhaustively explore a schedule that uses load and the amount of parallelism to ask to minimize response time and maximize uh, 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 and, and minimize the response time of the tail as well as maximize throughput. And so we solve an offline optimization problem, and that gives us a little interval table. And what, oops, and what that interval table tells us is based on the number of requests in the system, how much parallelism to add. And, and, and that's our, our request is the amount of load. So let's say we have two jobs come into our system at the same time. Because there's no load on the system, we parallelize both of them. And so that shortens their execution time. And so that reduces the probability of queuing in the future. And then we add this green one. This green one really didn't need parallelism, but we give it to it anyway because we're not doing anything else. And, we're, and we know it will, will complete quickly in this case. All right, so now the blue request comes in slightly later. And now we're at three. And it says, OK, parallelism of one. But we don't have resources for it. So even though we start it, we might be slowing down the green thread a little bit if they do some sharing of the resources. Or this thread just uh, sits in a wait queue. So we can run just as soon as the other uh, threads stop running. And so then we have the purple thread come in. And it, uh, it has to wait until it gets to execute it all. But then the green thread leaves the system, and we go back to three, and the purple thread is at parallelism one, and so it gets to start executing. And as soon as the, this thread leaves, then it, would execute, then it could have more parallelism. And so that gives us this beautiful graph that hugs the bottom of the line I showed you before and lets you both increase the, the um, and that's 99 percentile latency, request the request per second and shorten the, 
the tail latency. And so you can use this in two ways. You could just say, I'm going to use this approach and buy fewer servers, and that saves you more money. Or with the existing servers that you already have, you can reduce the tail latency and the energy that this system consumes. All right, so that's our judicious perilsome. And now we're going to try to see how much of the rest of the talk we can get through. <laughs> so now, instead of doing Perlsum, maybe that's too much uh, change to the system. Maybe that your requests don't parallelize very well. What you can also do is use the hardware to help you. So you can use dynamic voltage scaling to s focus and speed up the tail. So currently, all requests run just as fast as the server will let you run. But if what if instead we run the short request at a, a lower frequency, and th so they consume less energy, and we only run the, the, the long requests at the highest frequency, and so we control their tail, and we lower the total cost of ownership because we lower the energy that uh, this system uses. And, then you, and that's available in servers today. So if you built an asymmetric multi-core, this can work even better because if you have microarchitectural techniques at your disposal, you can do much better in terms of the efficiency than DVFS does. DVFS is a good user, but it has a certain range. The, the microarchitecture techniques let you use a much bigger range of, of performance uh, energy power trade-off. All right. So you've seen the Perlsum insights. And so this is, has a very similar flavor to it. And it's called slow to fast. So what we're going to do first is when a, a request arrives, we're going to execute it on either at a lower voltage and frequency, or we're going to execute it on a slow processor. And then the challenge uh, is, of course, how to pick D, when to migrate. And what if in, in uh, the, your power domain, the fastest speed is not available, or in your asymmetric multi-core domain, the, the fastest core is not available? So the insight is to use the big core just enough to get your, to get your tail target latency. And then that determines when to migrate. But the other idea is when you have competition for the asymmetric multi-core, then you want to migrate oldest first. So unlike classical scheduling for interrupts when something's run a long time and you say, oh, you're a bad job. We're going to schedule. The operating system is going to start interfering you and giving you lower priority. We're going to always give the longest executing time the highest priority. And so if we become crowded on the little cores, the oldest, oldest request gets to migrate first to the biggest core. So in steady state, we've created a system where the youngest uh, are on the slowest. If you have a medium core, then the middle-aged are on the medium core, and then the oldest are on the fastest core, the opposite of real life. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so then dynamically, you uh, have a controller design where you take that target input, and you take the cumulative distribution function, and you take a notion of load, and you feed that in, and you come back with uh, the tail latency you, you expect, and you use uh, basic uh, controller design. We just used an off-the-shelf tool to design our controller. And then we modeled the space of um, the, it's, this gives you a linear controller, so we modeled it piecewise for, for uh, systems that had more than one, for more than one speed. So the state of the art when we started this work was a system called Pegasus from Google and Stanford. And what they had done was notice, well, at low load, we can usually make the tail latency. So at low load, we'll slow all the cores down. So it was in all the cores went slower. And then as load increased, they increased the speed of all the cores together. So our approach is doing a per core 
improvement. And we also explored a bunch of different configurations, but for the purposes of this talk, we're just going to talk about uh, two of them and, two, and in this framework. In this framework, you can adjust so you can optimize tail latency only, and you can say, I don't care how um, much energy I use, I'm going to rein in tail latency. And so that uses a zero threshold in our system, so you run on the fastest core if it's available. And then the EETL is the, 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 the ideas I just spoke about, where you give that target latency and you try to use that big core, that fastest speed, only as much as you need it. And this does a much more energy efficient solution. So here are the results of those three systems. So on the left hand graph, again, we have 99th percentile latency and requests per second across the bottom of both graphs. And then on the far right, we have uh, energy that this system is consuming. And these are using DVFS on a Broadwell server, server level machine. And so you can't see Pegasus because it's under energy uh, efficient tail latency in terms of the 99th percentile latency, but, uh, but it's showing you that both of them can meet the tail latency target that you sent for a wide range of requests per second until you just get to the, the exponential part of the curve where you have too much load and no, 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 nothing you can do in the, this system. But that you can uh, lower that even further by using it judiciously just for the longer requests with, uh, with the, 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 the reddish line on the bottom. All right, but now go over on the request per second and the normalized energy. You pay for that in energy. You can't, like, if you have a system that's not meeting its tail latency goals, and this is uh, the only way to do it, say your goal was 150, then, uh, then you could consume more energy and you could get the system to meet your goal if you had a software hardware trade off here, essentially. But if you, uh, but Pegasus gives you some energy benefits and it's meeting our target, which was 200 in this case. But energy efficient tail latency, which is this dynamically doing it per core, gives you, a, gives you another uh, uh, 50, approximately 10% 10, 10 improvement in energy, which uh, makes, can make a big difference in the long run. Now let's look at, uh, uh, since we don't have a server class uh, asymmetric multi-core, which is AMP, uh, we, what we did for our methodology was use emulation. And if you're interested in the details, I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards. And so in this configuration, I'm showing the results you just saw with um, DVFS. Uh, for th the three systems are still on there, but I've added two more systems. And those two systems are in green, and those are the, the DVFS with EE, sorry, the, the, the asymmetric multi-core just optimizing tail latency or trying to do tail latency and energy efficiency. So if we look at just tail latency on the DVFS versus AMP, we see that you can, uh, the asymmetric multi-core pushes you out in the, the request per second, which is great because you can handle same capacity. And these machine, these two systems are configured so they burn the same, um, they have the same amount of hardware and uh, energy and power budgets so that they're, they're comparable systems. And then if you look at uh, the requests per second and their normalized energy, you can see, well, under low load, they burn the same amount of energy, but as the load gets higher and higher, uh, the, the, the benefits of the underlying architecture get more and more, more exposed, and you can see that on the normalized energy. So the more load you have, the more energy you save. And then if we look at just the green lines now, we see um, that we can really push out the request per second with and do it energy efficiently because we're staying down here at this best energy level for the whole time. And so that concludes the technical portion of my talk. And so what I've talked about today is, uh, is to optimize anything 
you must understand it in more detail than, uh, than you do now. And, uh, and we needed new tools in order to diagnose the tail because of the in situ th in situ situation where the tail is often a rare event and caused by things that you can't capture. And so we needed new mechanisms to do that. And then by separating out the causes of, um, uh, causes of the tail, which were noise, cueing, and work, we need different techniques. And I didn't talk about anything today to do with cueing, but we, the same mechanism that helps us profile, we've actually shown how you can help diagnose cueing and do, get rid of a bunch of cueing in different ways. And then for noise, I showed you results that showed how to do replication so it uses less resources and is a more efficient and mechanism work of others. And then I also showed you so, some work of my team on how you could use judiciously apply your resources to these long requests when there's work in them and get a lot of benefit from that. So what you should take away from today is that cumulative distribution function is a powerful tool for this offline optimization. And so you can use much more uh, aggressive techniques when you characterize your system this way. And that tail efficiency is not equal to average or throughput. So some of the assumptions that we have about optimizing throughput, th throughput for these systems need to be tempered with, with uh, sacrificing a little bit of the average in order to get the tail. And there also happen to be some queuing benefits in there that uh, aren't in your standard network queuing class that you need to become aware of. And that, that one of the things we're seeing in the hardware is uh, more and more heterogeneity. A lot of focus of the architecture community has been building about specialized speed up uh, things for certain workloads. What I've talked about today is software that can, can exploit the differences in um, the workload to match the software to the hardware, and, but still use more general purpose processors, which hopefully there'll be more techniques like this so that we don't all need 100 different specialized components on our chip, which is too hard to manufacture or to reconfigure within FPGA every time we have a new workload, both of which have huge challenges for, for the engineering of that. And I had a great time, and I thank you for your attention, and I'll take a few questions. I think I have two minutes for questions. <laughs> so he, let me repeat. He just said, even when you do some of these things, there'll still be a few long requests, even though the, 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 that 1% will, will uh, have a shorter, but there'll still be some one percenters. So what do you do about those? There's still some things in that 1%. And so what do you do about that? Well, you can iterate on this process. Well, I th think that uh, one of the things that people have done to good, good effect is, 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 is have en enough redundancy in their system or not give perfectly precise answers so you don't wait for some of those longest requests. So that's one thing. But they're still there gobbing up your system. So you, you have to have dynamic techniques detecting them and doing something, right? But the fewer of them, the better engineered your system. These systems are highly engineered, so a lot of people spend time trying to get more and more stuff out of there. So hopefully they will <laughs> reduce it. But you'll always have occasionally. In the blue shirt. So uh, we used all of Wikipedia English. I meant to mention that on the, the, when I described the workload. We used all English Wikipedia documents, which uh, were like four gigabytes of, of uh, data, or sorry, yes, filling up our, and a big machine filling up our memory, and we used thousands of queries from test sets, and then we did validation on 
from, we learned on 10,000 and then had a 2,000 uh, queries that were our, our test ones. And so when I showed you the 200 queries at the end, those were the 200 in the tail of one run. When you do a different run, you get a different 200, and uh, only a few, like only about 10% which are the ones with the green, always appear, in, the ones with work always appear in the tail? That's a good question. Sorry, I didn't uh, mention that sooner. And so, and then we matched, we, we showed that the instructions per cycle of leucine was pretty much matching uh, the reported instructions per cycle for Google and also for uh, that we observed directly for Bing. So that it was a good match for their index serve when you don't hit in a cache. So you can implement, you can implement the scheduler parts of the parallelism and also of the, the running on a faster core. You can actually control that at an application layer if you have control over the entire machine for this, for this service. But if, you, but if you have multiple services running on the machine, then you have to have some cooperation from the operating system. Good question. And, oh, sorry, I didn't repeat it. Do you need to do, can you do this at the application level, or do you need to do this at the operating system level? And so you can do both, but if you have the machine to yourself, you can do it all in the, mach the, the application layer. And the Lucene results were all done at the application layer. So I think I've run out of time. I really thank you for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference.